Let's investigate the theorem from the last video in terms of a concrete example. Let's look at this matrix and let's decide if it's invertible. And if it is invertible, let's find the inverse. And I'm going to fudge a little because I know the answer to this. I know that this matrix is invertible. So I'm going to do the work of finding the inverse. before I've answered this part of the question. Cheating slightly, I suppose. But to determine if this is invertible, we should put it in reduced row echelon form. And to find the inverse, we should take all of the steps that we perform on this matrix and also perform them on the identity. So usually at this point, I pause the video and do the work on my calculator, but not to this time. We'll take the first row, multiply it by negative one, and add it to the third row. And that gives us this. And now over here, We'll take the first row, multiply it by negative one, and add it to the third row. This next step isn't strictly necessary, but we see three and we see six. Those are both divisible by two. Let's divide this second row by three. And over here, we will divide the second row by three. Now let's take this second row, multiply it by negative two and add it to the third row. And over here, we'll take the second row, multiply it by negative two, and add it to the third row. We need a one here. So we'll um, multiply the third row by negative one third. Over here, we will also multiply this third row 
by negative one third. So things are getting ugly, positive one third, positive two ninths, negative one third. Over here, now we'll work up. We'll multiply the third row by negative two and add it to the second row. Now over here, We'll multiply the third row by negative two. I am no longer able to just do this in my head. There's the third row times negative two. And we should add that to the second row. One third is three ninths. And here, is our new second row. And alas, I did not quite manage to keep this on one page. So let me pause this. Finally, we'll multiply the third row by negative two and add it to the first row. So the third row times negative two, negative two thirds, negative four ninths, positive two-thirds plus the first row. Wait. Uh, yes, that's right. I thought I saw a mistake, but I didn't. And after all this work, we finished the Gauss-Jordan elimination over here. And we do get the identity matrix. So this matrix is invertible. And over here, we have found the inverse. Let's end this video with an observation, however. If we were working with our calculus,
activator, we couldn't have done things this way because our calculator doesn't tell us what steps it's performing. It just performs them all behind the scenes. So what I just demonstrated is how the theorem theoretically works. But in practice, there is another way of doing this. And that's to take the matrix who was inverse you're trying to find and augment it, not with a single column, but with the entire identity matrix. You see, to go from here to here, we took the first row, multiplied it by a negative one, and added it to this first row. To go from here to here, we took the first row, multiplied it by negative one, and added it to the third row. This allows us to do both those things at once. Take the first row, multiply it by negative one, and add it to the third row. And after you do the Gauss-Jordan elimination on your calculator now, we get this. You see your matrix has turned into the identity. And this over here has turned into the inverse. So this is how we would actually find inverses using this theorem. We wouldn't think of having two separate elimination processes. We would combine those and perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on a single larger matrix. Thanks.